Started to explore and challenge ideas. You can explore your own ideas, not being certain about what you think yet about a particular issue. You can you can posit it here and get some feedback, um, and, and and you can challenge other people's ideas and challenge your own. Um, we we encourage robust challenge, but we also uh, look for respectful challenge too. And the whole idea of debating is to try and we can try and move us towards some kind of clarity at the end. Um, that's for the new people. For the old people who've been here before, I'm really looking forward to seeing your lockdown haircuts as we progress through the evening. Um, I'm not going to speak too much because tonight my internet, as it would, has decided it's going to be really uh, dirty. Um, but in terms of what now for Scottish independence, the question this evening, um, we're not so much interested in the soap opera that's been unfolding in Hollywood the last few days. We're much more interested in the implications for that for um, our country, for the institutions that um, run our country, for our leaders who lead the country, uh, and for citizens who live in this country. What, what are the implications of this um, massive uh, sideshow, in a sense? Um, we're very lucky this evening to have a, a distinguished panel, um, and I'm going to introduce them very briefly in the order that they will speak. Um, uh, uh, Mo's going to put more substantial biographies up in the chat for you to see. We have Jim Sillers, um, who's going to speak first, a Scottish politician, independence campaigner, and former deputy leader of the SNP. Uh, we ha next have Michelle Ballantyne, MSP, who's the, uh, the new Reform Party, Reform UK Party in Scotland. Um, thirdly, we have Ian McQuarter, who's a, a Herald columnist, and uh, author of uh, Disunited Kingdom, uh, the, how Westminster won a, a referendum but lost Scotland. And lastly, we have Alistair Donald, who's the Associate Director and Associate Director at the Academy of Ideas and co-author of The Future of Community. Each of our speakers will speak for between five and six minutes. Um, as Mo indicated, pro, in, in, in a kind of provocative kind of way to sh share the, the overview of their thoughts and after that, it's very much over to you to ask questions, but also to try and make contributions if you want. It's fine to sit and listen, um, but we want people to participate in this public conversation. So, okay, well, welcome everybody, and um, thank you for asking me to come and speak with you tonight. Um, I was asked to be a bit provocative and start the ball rolling. So I'm, I'm going to take you back to when I first got involved with politics in 2010. Um, probably somewhat of a reluctant politician originally. I was persuaded over a period of two years because I was arguing the toss about the fact that I felt things weren't being done correctly. Um, I was involved in drug and alcohol services at the time. I'd given evidence to the parliament um, and I was particularly looking at children's services and the impact of children on services. And that overlapped with the um, introduction of the name person. And I was part of the GoFEC implementation team that was doing that. But no sooner had I got involved with politics and agreed to it, become elected as a local um, councillor with the Conservative group at the time and leading them, off we went on the independence referendum trail. And it was two years of knocking doors, endless conversations. And I have to say, it wasn't the civic joyous event that I often hear it referred to. Now, if, you're, if you were on the side of the union at the time, it was a tough trail um, and it often felt that you were being attacked for even having opinions. Um, but the thing that made it most difficult, and I think this is something as we move forward we've really got to think about, is that we were all arguing in the ifs, buts, maybes. You know, we were arguing the same facts from different sides. We were arguing about what would or wouldn't happen if a decision was made to leave but nobody really knew for certain. We believed we were right. The independence side believed they were right, but we were all to some degree guessing. And I think when we went into the Brexit referendum, we found ourselves quite often on different sides. I was on the Leave side in that. We were back in the same kind of debate. What would actually happen? What would it be like? So I think as we look forward, one of the things we've got to think about is, do we want to go to any other referendums? Personally, I'd rather we never had any more. I think two has been enough for anybody. But if we have any more, perhaps we ought to decide the terms 
first. And perhaps we ought to know what the deal is going to look like before we vote on it. Because that way, every single citizen knows what they're getting themselves into. And I think that is the fundamental that we should start talking about. Because we can all make arguments about what it might look like. But for your average person who's not heavily involved in politics, they're either voting with their heart or they're voting with their head or a combination of vote, both. And I get the idea of sovereignty. I, I was a leaver. I voted for Brexit. I understand that, that need to take back control and to actually have a say in what goes on in your own country. So I have some empathy with those who actually, oops, just nearly lost my computer, um, who say, you know, that they want independence. But then the head kicks in as well. Um, I believed in the island sovereignty as a joined up for four units that work together within an island waters. What I don't get is breaking up the island. And I don't get it because for 300 years, it's actually worked very, very well. And I think we, we've seen that particularly over the last year with COVID. And the arguments that have been brought forward that Brexit has changed things and therefore we should leave, I find difficult because the majority of our trade, of 60% of our trade is within the UK. Only 17% or thereabouts went to the EU. So the argument that Brexit is a disaster for our economy means that you're automatically going to multiply that several fold if you're talking about breaking up the UK. I think when you talk about differences, I've lived, I started in my life in the north of England, spent my teenage and, and very early 20s in the south of England, and I've spent most of my adult life in Scotland. I don't think there is a massive difference between the people. I've certainly not felt it and seen it. You know, we have so much in common. We have so much in the way of families, friends, cultures. And I am, uh, or I've always thought of myself when I came to live in Scotland as the proverbial, you know, when you give up smoking and you become really anti-smoking. When I came to Scotland, I became terribly pro-Scotland. You know, you know, I've sung Flower of Scotland with great gusto at rugby matches and I, you know, defended the, the rights of Scotland. And I've even had to defend its weather on a regular basis. You know, it isn't the Arctic North. You know, it's a fabulous place. I love where I live and I love the culture. I reel, I sing my local folk songs. But the divisiveness of, of talking about breaking up has often put me in a difficult position. And as an individual, the horrible things that come back at you, and I say that as somebody who's lived here for 31 years, I've raised my children here. I've had my children here and raised them here. You know, I've been a local councillor. I'm a member of the parliament. You know, I've built a business here. We've paid taxes here. We've employed people here. And I certainly have no intention of leaving Scotland. And yet the names calling, the divisiveness has been horrific. I don't like that as a way to live. I don't want that for my children and my grandchildren. And I don't think most people in Scotland want to live in that kind of atmosphere. I think we have huge opportunity. I think sadly devolution has fueled nationalism. And instead of harnessing devolution effectively, we've used it to divide the population. I think it's time to really take a long hard look at devolution and make it work for us. We have real opportunities to actually start solving some of our problems. And our problems are quite big in some cases. Our economic growth is half of that of south of the border. And it's not because we don't have ingenuity and ability up here. It's that somehow we, we've lost track of trying to make Scotland the best place to live and work. We've lost track of what that really means. We've, we've stopped admiring the wealth creating sector and we've started to diss it at every opportunity. We need to get back on track. We need to get our education back on track. We need to make our health services work for people. So the focus is not where it ought to be. And I think we have an opportunity. We need to stop fighting with each other and we need to start building the country that we all want to live in. Brilliant. Hi, Ken, as well. Thank you. Bang on time. It is. That, that was bang on time as well. And uh, I hope you haven't broken your computer. Well, I think we should just try and bring Jim in the one, the first point I want 
to make heads, that I regard the unionist position as legitimate in both in independence and pro-union are legitimate points of view by the division that we have at present. I'm for independence, I'm an economic nationalist, not a big end nationalist. And my concern at the moment is about the health of the independence movement and the position of the Scottish nation. It's, I don't really be persuaded by the opinion polls because the electorate don't really switch in to making a decision until probably about the last 10 days before an election when people begin meant to really focus. So I think at the moment, it's my view, that the country is pretty equally divided. Um, there's a great deal of frustration in the nationalist movement. And the SNP has sort of produced a panacea to buy off some of the frustration with a level or an act. Um, oh, this is really bad. Um, this is the panacea. There's two parts of the panacea. One is the referendum bill. And the other is the 11 point plan. Both take us along the road to the court of session court. Anybody who's read the Muller judgment knows fine the Supreme Court will say Parliament at Westminster is sovereign, the Constitution is within the reserve powers of the 1990s, you can't have your referendum. And so they're stuck. And I think a number of people realize that. And so what we've got out of this frustration um, is the split three or four new independence parties who are going to be run uh, in the May elections along with the SNP. So there's a real problem. But I think that's a sort of mechanical problem. But the real problem lies in policy. We've had two major um, distorting events. Brexit, and in case we Brexit, and the pandemic. And we don't know how Brexit will work out in relations between the UK and the EU and possibly Scotland and England and the EU. And certainly nobody knows exactly what the pandemic has done to the Scottish uh, economic and business base. So before anybody starts to say to people, we want you definitely to vote for independence and join us in the pressure for an immediate referendum, there's one hell of a amount of work that has to be done that in fact, is not being done. I mean, where is Scotland to locate itself? Is it to be just sovereign Scotland in a trading relation uh, with England, in a military relationship with NATO, which is also political? Yeah, I'm, going to, I'm just going to wind you up, Jim. Sorry, you, we, you, we heard you kind of midpoints there in terms of the economic um, uh, and, and the political context not being thought through enough in terms of the, the nationalist cause. And I think that's a, a point well made. And, and then we just kind of lost your, your summary at the end. So maybe you can come back in at a later point and do that. Can we, can we move on to Ian now, please? Okay, uh, yeah, so I'm- uh, yeah, There we go. Yeah, I'm very sorry we can't um, hear from Jim because he's a very important figure in Scottish politics now, mainly because he is semi-detached from the independence movement, from the SNP at any rate, um, and he has a, a degree of objectivity about the conduct of the Scottish government, which um, I'm afraid is sadly lacking amongst the hierarchy of the Scottish National Party at the moment, and 
uh, he will no doubt um, refer to that if you, you hear from him again. But, but on, on this general question of um, independence and the future, I mean, my position has always been that I'm, I'm an agnostic in a sense on the Scottish question, except for this, that I, you know, I believe it's better for nations on the whole to run their own affairs. I think it's better for them and it's better for their neighbours. And a situation where one country is, is to a certain extent dependent on benefits from another is not a healthy uh, situation. And that is, I think, what we've been seeing as a breakdown of that relationship over the past 30 years. I mean, I don't, uh, I, I, I was all for the Act of Union 300 years ago. I mean, I think that was a great, a great achievement uh, of enlightenment statesmanship, which ended nearly 400 years of almost continuous warfare between Scotland and England, in, in most cases uh, of which Scotland came off worst. But the, the, that, was, that deal was struck between two pre-existing nations and nations which did not lose their national identity as a result of that union. It was a union largely of interest of the elites uh, in Scotland and in, in the rest of the UK, joining forces, if you like, to exploit the commercial potential of the emerging uh, British Empire. And over the past uh, uh, half century, particularly, that uh, relationship became questioned, became undermined, and gradually we've seen a process, uh, an iterative process in a sense, under which Scotland has repatriated most of its political um, power. It has its own elected parliament now with uh, sovereignty and home affairs and has been gradually uh, acquiring more uh, economic powers. Now, the, I, don't, I don't believe any nation is independent and there's no such thing as separation anymore. So this is not really the issue here. It's always a matter of degrees. And one of the unfortunate developments in 2014, or rather one of the unfortunate ways in which it was misrepresented, was that that was, that was actually presented as a form of separatism, separatism, a form of independence, which was not what was actually being proposed. And I think Michelle said it's a shame that people didn't really know what they were in for and they weren't uh, given a de any details of what independence would mean. Well, there was quite a lot of detail and it was in a 670 page document, which the Scottish government produced. It was largely drafted by Nicola Sturgeon uh, in 2013 called Scotland's Future. It was a white paper on independence. And what that was proposing was not um, any kind of formal separation or independence. It was a, it was a form of, of federalism or if you like, confederalism, because the, there would have been the premise of that document was that Scotland and England would remain within the, Uni the European Union. Consequently, they would, um, there would be no border between Scotland and England. There would be no regulatory issues because both sides would remain in the single market uh, of the European Union. And also the whole series of issues would gravitate to uh, like, like management of the environment, for example. That's, that's one which is, is causing issues just now. Agricultural support. These kinds of things would be gravitating to the Brussels level. Um, and, if, and, and it was very explicit about the maintenance of key institutions of the United Kingdom. In fact, what it was proposing was a new version of the United Kingdom. It was proposing to keep uh, institutions like the Crown, uh, the monarchy, it might not be so keen on that now, but it, the, the SNP was very keen on keeping the Queen, uh, um, keeping the Queen back in, in 2014. It would maintain the BBC, it would maintain Defence Corporation, and of course, crucially, it would have retained a single currency with the rest of the United Kingdom, and that would um, so that was the clearest um, demonstration that this was not any kind of formal separation in the way it had been uh, portrayed. Uh, I think people are beginning to realise this in retrospect. In fact, Gavin Esler, the former Newsnight presenter, has just written a book called How Britain Ends, which has just been published, and he says exactly this, that in fact everybody made a mistake. This, that, like 2014 actually was the best way of retaining the United Kingdom in some form, because things are now radically different. Um, now that um, Brexit has become a reality, um, the independence project that was, uh, was, ex was explained in immense detail in 2014 no longer applies because uh, clearly Scotland will have to leave the United Kingdom um, and will not be in the European Union. It will have to presumably, I mean, this is Nic Nicola Sturgeon in Visit to Scotland rejoin the European Union at a very early, early stage. I'm not so sure if that is going to be the case. 
after they've seen what it's like being outside the European Union. I'm not so sure people are that enthusiastic about rejoining it, certainly under its present uh, management. And more importantly, there would be inevitably a hard border with the rest of the United Kingdom. So there would be all these regulatory issues, there would be border controls, and um, all the difficulties which we've seen in Ireland, the Northern Ireland Protocol, except magnified immensely, because at least there, the EU was prepared to countenance the province remaining within a regulatory orbit of the European Union. Um, it, would not, it would not be happy for Scotland to do that. Scotland will have to be so sovereign. It will have to be independent from the, the, um, the rest of the United Kingdom. It will have to have its own central bank and it will have to be, uh, have its own currency. Even if it doesn't join uh, the euro, uh, it will still have to uh, have its own currency autonomy. So it is a very, very different project that is being that is on offer. And I, my main criticism actually of the SNP at the moment is that it hasn't really been upfront about that. It hasn't, it's tried to suggest that the situation as of 2014 more or less still applies. Um, and all these issues are just technical problems that could be resolved. They're not, they're immensely difficult and immensely hard uh, problems, which will, I think, uh, weigh heavily on the minds of Scots if they are uh, asked to vote on this again. And just finally, on the prospects for independence, I mean, we've, we've seen the, uh, uh, the, the soap opera as it's been described, the, this fallout between Sturgeon and uh, Salmond. What's behind that, of course, is a very profound uh, disagreement, um, a trauma of, almost within the Scottish National Party about its direction, and Nicholas, the failure of Nicola Sturgeon to press ahead on the independence accelerator, despite the fact that she has, as she puts it, she's had successive mandates in the various elections since 2014, where as you, as I'm sure everybody is aware here, the SNP utterly dominates the political scene in Scotland and is still going to, despite all these uh, manifold problems, it's still going to be the largest, by far the largest party uh, in, in May in, this, in the Scottish parliamentary elections. However, I don't think there's going to be another referendum anytime soon. I don't think Nicola Sturgeon actually wants one or is planning one. There's no indication to me that the movement is being mobilised for an independence referendum. I don't see any fundraising. Um, the, the yes groups of the various organizations, grassroots organizations, which were so effective in 2014 are largely moribund. And also, as, as I think probably Jim was going on to explain, Nicola Sturgeon's um, route to independence or her proposal for independence really doesn't stand up to much examination because she's saying that um, uh, that, that her route would have to be wholly consensual, it had to be constitutional, and it would have to be via a Section 30 order, as it's called, which is a, a motion in the Westminster Parliament, which gives Holyrood the right to hold a, a, a legally binding referendum. That is not going to happen. There's absolutely no way that uh, Boris Johnson is going to entertain that. He saw what happened to David Cameron with his referenda. He's, uh, you know, it doesn't mean, even if the SNP won an absolute majority in May, he would still not um, um, grant that. And I therefore, that, that route to independence is blocked off. You got there. Brilliant. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was getting twitchy there. Right. Thank, thanks very much. That's really good. I mean, and, and the focus that there in terms of, uh, the, you know, maybe some of the shenanigans within the SNP, but I think presenting the SNP as a monolithic um, organisation is wrong these days. There are many um, uh, groupings within the SNP and, and, and some people want to move fast, some people want to move slow. Some people, I mean, is the nationalist movement just the SNP is one question we might want to kind of look at later on. Alistair, we'll come to you and then we'll go to the audience. Okay, uh, thanks, Simon. So I, I've more or less taken this discussion as an invitation to look at what next for independence, given the whole sort of parameters of the uh, uh, Sturgeon Salmon and uh, Farago, if you like. So uh, is always a bit wary, being definitive about what's next, but some tentative observations really rather than uh, definitive answers. So I think the, f the first thing that's useful to look at is what all this means for the Scottish political system. Um, you know, whatever the revelations about the whole Sturgeon, Salmon, he said, she said, uh, psychodrama, if you like, it's surely the exposure to everyone of the inner working of Scottish politics that's been the real crux of this affair. And I think which uh, 
is exacerbating some existing disquiet. Uh, so Michelle talked about uh, uh, the decline of services like education and health. And it's not only the decline of those services, but it's the way in which no one in government seems to want to, to, to acknowledge that or publish reports or, or you know, take any sort of responsibility for that. So there's, there's a kind of reluctance uh, to accept responsibility going on in government. Or you have political parties which largely seem cut off but from the concerns of their members, N none more so actually than the SNP. If you look at the uh, elections to the executive, for example, you could really see that there's not just a divorce of parliament from the people, but a divorce of even the leadership of the parties from their, from their members. Um, so, in a way, yes, Sturgeon survived, but I think the real damage is to the uh, operation and reputation of the, the Scottish Parliament, which, you know, we need to remember, uh, is justified as a means to give a voice to the Scottish people. That, that was the whole reason for its uh, creation 20 odd years ago, that it would provide an alternative to the distant uh, Parliament of Westminster and, and allow Scottish people to have their say. And it really seems that it's not that way. Instead, you, you know, it actually, in many ways, looks even more sordid than Westminster. I mean, it was it was a Westminster MP, David Davis, who was the the one who, uh, under parliamentary privilege, revealed that essentially the SNP were undertaking a fishing exercise for uh, people to come forward so that they could nobble uh, salmon. Even the reports, uh, even even the response to the two reports over the last couple of days have been quite interesting. On the one hand, you've had uh, endorsement and acceptance of the one that's conducted by a friendly judge in absolute secrecy. You know, I have the number of articles I've read which have commended him for not revealing anything that was going on. And on the other, you have uh, a, a report that's been published conducted by parliamentarians from different parties, which is condemned for that very thing of being a Advice of product of politics. So it seems in a way that uh, uh, the Scottish Parliament doesn't want to do politics. It wants to have procedures and committee rooms and to do things outside the eye of the, 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 the Scottish people, which I think is, you know, in, potentially incredibly damaging given what uh, the Scottish Parliament is based on and how it, it legitimizes itself, which leads me to the second thing, which is I think there's a question uh, as to what this affair does overall for the authority of the Scottish government. I mean, if, if, if the parliament doesn't act in a way that gives voice to the people, then the government really doesn't have that mechanism of giving its consent for its, its, its rule. It, that, that seems to me to be a hugely damaging uh, part of, 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 of not just the last few months, but something that's been ongoing for a while. Um, it's you know it's it's something that I think the Scottish government have tried to deal with by trying to appeal to other sources of authority. And the, 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 the noteworthy one is, uh, I, I guess, they've tried to pursue pursue a, an agenda of social justice, if you like, through the different sort of identity politics that they've they've followed. And it's actually noteworthy, I think, that Sturgeon's response yesterday to Hamilton was very much to say this entire case was about these women who came forward and her actions were motivated by not allowing those complaints to be swept under the carpet. Uh, that she said, she spe specifically said actually, would be the factor that would most undermine the authority and confidence of the Scottish government. And already that looks like it's backfiring to some extent. Uh, accusations that the women have been abandoned or perhaps even cynically used for uh, party political purposes is not a good look. Um, the other uh, aspect of, of how they seem to legitimate themselves is, is as, as Ian's mentioned, the, the, you know, the source of authority comes partly from being a member of a, a supranational body like the European Union, which is, is obviously, as Ian said, problematic in that Scotland has now, uh, as part of the UK, has now left, so it would need to rejoin. But even more so the, during the last couple of months, uh, what are they rejoining? I mean, the EU every day during this vaccine farago seems ever more of a basket case. Uh, so, it, it, you know, how does that affect the case for independence that you want to join uh, a body that uh, itself doesn't seem to have uh, too much authority? So that seems to me to be a big issue. How, how does a potentially independent Scotland sell itself? That seems to be a more 
difficult exercise just now. And then the third thing that I wanted to mention was um, it's just quite interesting the way that the opposition to the SNP has been changing over, over recent months and, and perhaps slightly longer than that. I mean, let's face it, it's not been a good inquiry for the official opposition. Uh, the parliamentarians have been found uh, completely wanting in this whole affair, no more so than exposed to the, uh, the public through the glare of the television cameras in those committee rooms where they really didn't uh, appear up to the job. Um, the Tories, their entire strategy seemed to be that uh, Sturgeon would come a cropper and that would be enough to resolve the independence issue, um, which uh, suggests a lack of any wider strategy. Douglas Ross seems a bit more like a cartoon character to me than a serious politician. And, you know, Labour and Musawar might give them a bit of a temporary bounce, but really they, they do seem to be still yesterday's men. Who, who needs another technocratic party in Scotland when you've already got the SNP doing the job? So so in that way, I think this, the, the, the last few couple of months have, have really exposed the lack of a decent opposition. And that's where I think it's interesting what's been happening outside of official uh, uh, parliamentary or political party channels. Uh, 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 Jim mentioned the, the emergence of, of you know, other parties for independence, but there's also been all sorts of opposition groups that have uh, started to find a bit of a voice, a very angry voice at times as well. I mean, you've only got to look at um, uh, websites like Wings Over Scotland, which is, uh, you know, uh, an independence supporting website that has withdrawn its support for independence over the, the uh, SNP's uh, position on trans activism, or broadly speaking within the independence movement, uh, a, a disquiet at, at the fact that the SNP doesn't seem to be offering independence with any sort of sovereign type government. So that's interesting, I think, and, and it's one to watch. I, I don't know entirely what it means yet. Um, it doesn't seem to be anything that's organized or coherent and probably all these groups would dis you know, greatly disagree with each other on, on many different things. But I think the emergence of, 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 of dissent is an interesting uh, uh, development, which leads me, as, I guess, to one last question because- Very quickly. It, yeah, it, is I, okay, I'll wrap up then, sorry. Mm -hmm. Go go for you. What if it's quick? Just go for it. Well, it was quick. I, I mean, it's it just strikes me that Scotland has, for the last half century, made a case uh, as be for itself as being exceptional. That it's different. That it's more tolerant or more socialist or more liberal or whatever self-serving justification uh, fits at the time. And it does seem to me that what's happening just now bears more than a passing resemblance to wider UK politics in that we've got a very technocratic uh, party in government and uh, albeit a kind of nascent form of populist type resistance to that. So is Scotland exceptional anymore or is it fitting with a broader pattern of UK and even European politics? That's one to mull on. Brilliant. Okay, Thank, thanks to our, our speakers there. Um, and we should probably find enough time to answer all of these questions in the next hour and a half. Um, no bother. Um, just, just trying to answer Alistair's last one there. I think it's an interesting one. Um, what, what I'll do is I'll come out to the audience. If people start kind of sticking their hands up, um, I'll take you in the order that you put your hands up. And, um, and, and we'll take kind of maybe kind of eight or nine, maybe 10 people, and then go back to the panel and then kind of do a little bit of a, a tennis thing after that. So the first person I've got is, is Stuart Baird, and after that, I'll take Noah. So Stuart Baird first. Great, I hope you can uh, hear me fine and well. Uh, when I was thinking about what now for Scottish polit uh, independence, I was thinking it more in lines of what, what now for Scottish politics, because I feel as we all are, are, are trapped in this uh, ongoing uh, referendum experience, which was well highlighted by the panelists uh, with more on the way. So we're forever in this situation and it's this inability to move on from any actual results of a referendum. We've already, as has been mentioned, had to, we've all experienced them, but we seem to be trapped by them and then caught up in this idea that we're going to be having more. And as we're experiencing this, everyone's positions just become more and more entrenched. This entire situation has had a debilitating effect on all our institutions and sense of good governance, and it's been destructive for civil society. Uh, when we think of governance, we can think of the situation in, in regards to health or education, uh, the economy, 
And in terms of civil society, we can just go through a, a string of policies, which have already been mentioned from the named persons to, to women's rights to our hate crime. Uh, where, where do we get out from here? Where is the escape? Uh, are we just due for more of the same? And that's really, I had a, a sense of freshness when the, 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 perhaps when this, the election was under, uh, subject, you know, we we're building towards the, the vote, but it feels like we've got more of the same. I even got uh, quite excited with George Galloway's Alliance for uni Unity, a sort of Brexit style blockbuster that would unite the, the unionist cause. Uh, but we can just see that uh, the actual unionist parties are as divisive amongst themselves as uh, apparently Simon suggesting the SNP is. Uh, I, I'm interested in, in where, where, what party can offer something that perhaps is a bit of supportive for democracy, uh, somewhat more tolerant in our society and actually shows a degree of humility. Uh, perhaps with democracy, we've got a sense of supporting actual democracy, referendum results, or passing democracy to the local, to communities, to the bolstering of our councils and with civil society, treating it as a fragile thing. Uh, and not being able to run roughshod because you happen to have a couple of extra votes or a percentage here and there. The hate and crime and the degradation of women's rights stands out there. So I'm suggesting that perhaps Holyrood reduces its role, uh, gets off its plinth, and tries to focus on offering opportunities elsewhere. And I think opportunities is what I would want from any political party or for anyone. Opportunities in education, opportunities to live your life, uh, and away from any tinkering and further control. So I'm not too sure who's offering that, but I'm uh, uh, willing to hear from you. Okay. okay, after Noah, we've got Pauline, but on you go, Noah. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think it's important here that we don't forget the importance of the additional member system, which people will be aware is the electoral system used for the Scottish Parliament elections. Um, and I think it's important to mention it because obviously it's a semi-proportional system that's designed to stop parties getting a majority. So the fact that the SNP within the constraints of that system have been able to get a majority in 2011 and almost get a majority in 2016 does show the level of support for them. Um, and even as a unionist, I do think if they are able to get a majority in May um, and if they publish a manifesto saying we are running on the basis of having wanting to have another independence referendum, mm. I do think it is uh, unsustainable and untenable um, if Boris Johnson's government continually decides to deny um, that Section 30 order and doesn't allow it to properly happen. Um, and I wasn't, uh, I couldn't have voted for Brexit because I was too young um, and I didn't support it uh, in 2016, but I don't really understand how Brexit voters um, can deny the rights of Scot uh, Scottish people to at least have a say on their future again, not least given many of the arguments about sovereignty, about identity, if you change Scotland um, for the European Union, if you sort of change some of the words around, actually um, a lot of it is quite similar. Um, and my final point is sort of linked to Spain and Catalonia, not in terms of whether um, the relationship between um, the UK and Scot um, England and Scotland would become similar to that of Spain and Catalonia, if a section 30 order was denied, but in terms of what if Scotland was trying to rejoin the European Union um, as an independent nation, obviously all the current nations have to approve that. And there's always been the question of whether Spain would approve or, or approve or veto um, Scottish membership because of the precedent that was set for Catalonia, or is that something actually that's very um, over-exaggerated? Thank you very much. I'd like to sort of come back in. Uh, um, something that Noah said is, very similar to where I'd like to start. And I think I, I'm interested in what unites people in, um, in Glasgow, in Edinburgh, in Liverpool, where I'm based in Newcastle, where I'm from, and London and so on. What unites people across um, the, the British Isles, if you like. And I think in 2016, the EU referendum and the 2014 Scottish independence referendum had a great deal in common because I think both of them expressed the same um, yearning, I'd call it, um, that decisions taken in a national territory should be determined by the citizens of that national territory and not elsewhere and imposed on them. And I think that, um, that you know, this is something that really unites the people who voted for, um, for Brexit and people who voted for Scottish independence. 
However, I think what's really more important now, because we are where we are, is to look at what we've got and where it's where we're headed. Going back to Scotland, I think that devolution is clearly, you know, I think a really profoundly irresponsible and undemocratic form of government because it, it just exiles decision making on really fundamental questions somewhere else. Now it's Westminster, before it was, uh, it was Westminster and Brussels. I think it's also divisive and it fuels these resentments between people, but it also, I think, creates a, a kind of political inertia where no one really feels that they're able to make a decision, so very little happens. Um, I'm, with, um, I'm with Michelle and, and a number of other people who've said that referendums aren't really the answer to this. Um, I don't think another referendum is going to answer the question of what is driving the demand for independence, what's driving the demand for um, political autonomy and sovereignty. As a Democrat, I'd say that, you know, I believe that democracy, political, democratic power, political power is not just power to select your government or change your government, but it is the power to change the way that you are governed and I think it actually carries something much more profound than just rearranging the seating in the parliament. And it's these profound questions and people have touched on them. You know, I think it was Ian said something about, you know, the monarchy, that the systems, the structures of government. These are questions I think that people in Liverpool and Glasgow are asking, they're asking the same questions. And I'm disappointed in a way that we're divided when we're on the same territory um, we shouldn't, I think that, I think both sides, if I, all sides in this need to actually stop, stop and listen and, and understand what we have in common and try and find the, the answer to those questions together. Just a short question from me. For any um, independent supporters um, that are present in the panel, I would really like to ask why we don't have the concept of recovering Scotland's economy restoring well-paying jobs, restore our public services, and then surely people who want independence would find that they might get more support for it rather than, than try to get independence to do these things. Because at the end of the day, they're in st the fear's there that we will fail. Hi, thanks, Simon. Um, this is actually um, a question from an audience member who submitted it just before before the debate actually. Um, and he, let, he wants me to let you know he's a retired English chartered engineer, keen observer of Scottish politics who's lived and worked in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire for the last 40 years. And I think the question comes, I suppose, with the um, May elections on the horizon. Um, it's a question for Michelle. Will reform UK candidates in May's Scottish elections not simply take votes from the Conservative and assist the SNP to get more seats? Um, so I think that's one of the questions when we're thinking about the electoral maths and the Alliance for Unity. And um, that was a question from this gentleman in Aberdeen. So thank you. So kind of question in terms of the, the tactics of the ins and outs of voting there. We'll, we'll go to Alex, and then after that, what we'll do is we'll go back to the panel for their kind of, and then we'll come back out to the audience again. So, um, <laughs> I think it's um, interesting that the first time the um, democracy was mentioned was when it came out to the floor. Stuart uh, brought it up, and I think this is a massive problem with the conversation about the Scottish question in general. I don't think it can be answered unless democracy is put to the fore and the question of democracy is put to the fore. I say that because, again, I don't think we um, um, take into account the last 50 years in Scotland, but elsewhere, where we have seen um, a, 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 an absolute destruction um, of the influence of ordinary people on political life. And I think that's important because it tells us in this present moment that Scottish people or the public in general are removed from politics. So when it comes to the question of should we go this way or that way, 
devolution maps or a kind of independent Scotland, it becomes a technical question that the courts are involved in more than the public. Every time I hear independence, I don't hear democracy. And I think that's where we're failing, not in this discussion, of course, but in the discussion in general. Democracy has to come to the fore. Uh, the public's involvement, um, it, 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 its, its potential needs to come to the fore rather than technical requirements and new layers of institutions uh, and new layers, uh, 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 new layers of uh, technical governance. Who, who, who in the panel wants to speak? Uh, at the moment, I can see Ian. The democracy thing is, I mean, it's all about democracy, obviously. I mean, then it's how that is represented. And um, referenda are probably the worst form of democratic um, uh, uh, decision making in constitutional matters apart from everything else, because there's, there's no other way you can do it. You can't make a, con a constitutional move like independence can't be done just on the back of a, of a, a simple majority in an election for obvious reasons, because uh, that government has been elected on a whole range of issues of which um, independence may only be one. And therefore, I think it, it is understandable that it has to be factored out of the political debate and put, put to a specific question uh, for the people ultimately to decide. And, um, you know, I, but I don't think there's going to be a referendum in any time soon. I don't think there's going to be a referendum in the next decade. Um, as I said, I don't think Nicola Sturgeon is, is really wants one at the moment. I don't think she's prepared to face the kind of challenges that would be required in order to have to force a referendum against determined resistance from Westminster, because in our you know in our constitution it is uh, the con you know constitutional matters referenda are decided by Westminster. Would, Westminster would have to give. Uh, there would be a vote in the House of Commons authorising a referendum in Scotland. That's not going to happen. It just simply is not going to happen, no matter what happens in the in the May election. Um, apart from anything else, the Labour Party is not does not support a, another independence referendum just now. And they, their argument will be that um, when the UK is, dis, you know, abstracting itself from the European Union is is the wrong time to address. Um, another constitutional question in the back of that, which is uh, breaking up the United Kingdom. And I think a lot of people, even in Scotland, accept that logic because most people don't. If you ask in the opinion polls, it's in, clear that most people don't expect a referendum here, um, certainly not in the next five years. And, um, I, you know, I think it's, it's, these are just questions which you have to take on a, on a, as, as a, in terms of history and, and democracy. And Scotland is a nation and it will reacquire, gradually reacquire its, its um, autonomy. Um, to the extent that it's necessary. I don't think the devolution was a con or, or was um, a mistake. Uh, I think it was a reasonable um, democratic answer to what would then was a, a very profound doubt in the minds of many Scots that they were being governed in a way they wished because successive conservative governments were being elected in England, they were being rejected in Scotland. The myth of Scottish exceptionalism is essentially that, that there hasn't been a Conservative Party in Scotland. There hasn't been a party of the right, of the fashion, of the nature of the Conservative Party here of any significance, um, you know, since, the, since, since Margaret Thatcher. And so there was, a, there was perceived to be a democratic deficit, and that was addressed by Scotland re restoring its parliament after a referendum in which you had the kind of majority I think would be necessary to justify independence, which was basically... <clears throat> three out of four Scots voted for it. And uh, I mean, my only personal view is that, uh, that, um, that referenda should come at the end of a, a democratic process of, of disengagement rather than the start of it. And I'm, I, you know, I, I, always call, I always refer to what happened when um, Norway um, seceded from, Scandin from, uh, from Sweden in uh, 1904 when they had a referendum and the result was 99.98% yes. There was only 186 people in the whole country voted no. And I think, you know, that's a bit fanciful, but you do need to have a very sustained majority to make sure, to ensure you don't get a very narrow and contested result. And, um, we, you know, we saw that to a certain extent in the European referendum. And I think that's a, a, a legitimate um, demand that there should be a very clear settled will, that there should be another referendum. There isn't that at the moment, and there might be in a decade's time, but not right now. <clears throat>
pretty contentious there from Ian in a sense in that most people would see the SNP as synonymous with independence and you know, saying, uh, uh, putting across that the idea that Nicola Sturgeon doesn't necessarily want a referendum at the moment. Um, whether she'd admit that in public, I don't know. Uh, Michelle, have you got a couple of thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll run through some of the things, the questions that have been asked. Um, first of all, I think the whole the whole issue about what's next and, and whether Holyrood actually needs to um, sort of revise its role, rethink what it's doing. You have to remember that the whole point about devolution is it wasn't to create a parliament. It was it was an assembly originally. It was the SNP that renamed it and, and presented itself as a government. And that was all about framing the idea of, you know, a country that would stand alone and have nothing to do with anybody else unless it chose to. But the reality is education, the police, the justice system, they already operated on a Scottish basis and, and were strong and effective and well-delivered services at the time. When they went into the devolved parliament, mm -hmm. seen a decline in all these things because the focus has not been on what it was meant to be, which is about delivering really good services that are close to the people, that the people feel they have an absolute say in and can control by the way they vote. So there has been a bit of a disconnect in democracy in that sense, but it's because the focus has not been on what the whole devolved assembly, parliament, whatever you want to think of it as, was meant to deliver. So I think, I think that's a really important facet. And the divisiveness of devolution is not that devolution in itself is divisive, because devolution should be a good thing. I mean, I'm a huge believer in subsidiarity. I, I think we should be pushing control down to its its primary point. Mm -hmm. So if you look at education, it needs to be the control of that needs to be pushed down to schools, you know, more to the local authority, not decided at the centre all the time. Because if you really want control over what goes on, you need to be able to walk into your school, have a word with your headmistress or your teacher about what's going on there and get things changed. So this is about local power, local democracy. And the whole point about devolution was to allow us to do more of that. Instead, we've seen a sucking to the center and far more decision-making at the center, which has undermined the whole nature of, of devolution. In terms of the, the question around um, joining the EU, um, yeah, I think we'd have terrible problems trying to get into the EU. Um, economically, wouldn't meet the criteria, even if you wanted to join. I think uh, Spain would almost certainly veto it because they don't want to fuel the Catalonia problem. So I, I, th I think there would be an issue there. It's not a it's not a walk in acceptance at all. Um, I was asked uh, by the viewer who put the question in earlier about the question of whether a new party like Reform just splits the vote, and my answer to that would be really quite simple. If we're saying that nobody else can ever join the political game, if you like, if no other party, no other independent member is ever allowed to stand because that might split the vote in some way, you're actually saying that we can't have any advancement on democracy, that democracy in Scotland is going to stagnate, that, that you're only going to get the existing parties. And the conversation for me, and bearing in mind I left one of the existing parties, is that they weren't delivering what I believed was necessary for Scotland to move forward. You know, we are all participants in Scotland. We are the people of Scotland and it's not working. And if you don't believe that, look around you, look at what's going on, look at the decline in our industries, in our education, the, the failure of, of, of delivery of health service at point of need. And point of need means when you need it, not 15 months later after you've been in agony. These things aren't working. So if you just say nobody else can join that conversation, there can't be any change, then you're just accepting decline. I don't believe that. I, I believe we need change. I believe we need reform. And yeah, I, I think we should take the risk. And if it splits the vote, that's the risk we take. But the list system is proportional. And for a party like reform, we're starting by contesting list seats. And I think we need other voices. And some of what I hope parties like us, ourselves will put out is, is about giving you something different to look at, a different way forward, because the current ways aren't working. And you know what? The reason the SNP have had such a majority for years is because nobody else has offered any other vision. And when people go to the ballot box, it's not just about independence. 
I know a lot of people who voted for the SNP who would vote no when it came to an independence vote, but their attitude was that the only vision that was presented was from the SNP at the time. So the, there has been a flaw in Scottish politics and Labour, you know, everybody kept saying is Labour revived? Well, the SNP are Labour. And I think one of my colleagues on the panel said that earlier. But, you know, this idea of waiting for Labour, the SNP took that down. They took it from the outset. They took all Labour's voters. They are the new Labour. So we, we've, we've got a bit of work to do. If we're serious about democracy, if we're serious about the people feeling involved in what goes on in Scotland, we need to change things because I'm not the only one that's frustrated. And I know everybody who's, who's joining reform and standing for reform feels the same way. And we all come from diff different political backgrounds. So there's consensus in Scotland of dissatisfaction with what's been going on. And that's what needs to change. Right. Um, I'm going to go to Alistair then. And I'm, after that, I'm going to try take my life in my hands and go to Jim's uh, internet connection again. Uh, but uh, Alistair first, then Jim. So on Noah's question about the, uh, you know, it's impossible for anybody who supported Brexit to not support a new Scottish referendum. I mean, I have to admit, I'm a bit torn on 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 this because on the one hand, you know, I, I was a Brexiteer. I uh, supported referendums because I thought they were a bloody good way of um, introducing a situation in, into politics, which had largely become devoid of interest and divorced from normal people, they actually created a forum where important issues of the day would become the property of the people and debated as such. And that's what the whole Brexit referendum to me was. It was uh, 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 an inspiring uh, couple of years uh, and, you know, the aftermath of even more so in many ways of people becoming involved and trying to have a say in politics. So I'm for referendums. I think they're a good thing. My worry about the, the, the possibility of a new Scottish referendum is that in some ways it doesn't seem to be as much about doing that again as 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 much as a case of the losers of an initial referendum not giving their consent to the outcome of what that vote was and you know we've seen it quite a lot over the past few years where um, in elections or in referendums constantly a decision is taken and then those that are on the losing side refuse to uh, accept that decision you saw it in America in 2016 where the Democrats uh, refused to uh, accept the decision of, of, of the electorate and and you know went on to make all sorts of accusations about external powers and Russia and all, all, all the rest of it you've seen we've just seen it again in America in 2020 where Trump and, and the Republicans refused to accept the result of the the referendum so there's mm -hmm. there's something to be said at the moment i think for making a case that once you take a democratic decision that actually you have the confidence whether you're on the losing side or the winning side to actually respect that decision and it becomes something that you you say well we spoke on that and it becomes a reasonable time again before you before you uh, need to 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 take another decision on it but i think I think pr part of the problem just now is that nothing that seems to me that that's stood for by the, the the side that wants independence in Scotland, and by that I mean I mean there's all sorts of different views and opinions and parties rolled up in that. But to take the leadership of the SNP, everything uh, that they seem to want that's part of the argument for independence seems to me to be completely opposite in the spirit and reality of what creating a nation is all about. I mean, you just need to look at history and the, the movements in the 19th, early 20th century that were all about self-determination and arguing for the position of a nation, they were all about fundamentally accepting responsibility and taking on responsibility for the way that a country was run. It seems to me that the argument for independence just now is absolutely the opposite of that. It's a retreat from responsibility. I mean, Brexit basically has delivered the UK into a position where outside of the oversight of the EU, as a you know, federal four state nation, if you'd like, we have pushed ourselves into a decision where we are now in control of our own destiny. And that's an exciting project. And it seems to me that independence, with all its uh, desire to rejoin the European Union, to uh, find ways, as we've, as we've seen, 
you know, endlessly over the last uh, few months in the Scottish Parliament of retreating into committee rooms and any mechanism of taking decisions that doesn't involve normal people. That seems to be to me an evasion of responsibility. It's not about what uh, creating a nation uh, should be about. Just, um, and, and, and that I, I think to some extent explains the Sandra's question about the lack of an economic policy, because really the, F the SNP has no faith that Scotland will have an <coughs> independent economic policy. I mean, that's what rejoining the EU is all about. And Scot the SNP in the, what was it, 15 years ago or so, deliberately uh, removed from their constitution the idea of self-government. They replaced it with independence, which is a kind of wishy-washy concept, and removed the idea of self-government. So if you have no confidence of self-government, then why would you have an independent economic strategy? It would, it would make no sense because you're already setting out to rely on other people. Finally, um, just the, the, the thing on the split vote and, and uh, Alliance for Unity. I mean, I... I, I just think it's interesting what's happening just now that people are arriving at different ways of thinking about the, 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 the uh, you know, what's happening in Scotland and how to either support or oppose independence. So I'm, I'm all for people um, to, doing something different. And I think Alliance for Unity has been a breath of fresh air in many ways. I mean, it's quite interesting that it's posing itself as anti-nationalist now rather than pro-union. I think that's an interesting shift that's taking place, that there's a kind of anti-nationalist movement. Um, but I, I wish that, it, so one of the good things it did, I think, was it, it said, we will stand on the, the grounds of repealing the hate crime bill, which I thought was, a tr it, it, you know, Stuart said in the first question, what is there that, that people are standing for that's a kind of point of principle? And I thought that was a, a really good point of principle to say, vote for us, we will repeal the hate crime bill. Unfortunately, they also want to <laughs> support people in Labour and other parties who supported the hate crime bill. So that principle kind of went out the, w out the window a little bit with the alliance. But, you know, I would say a party that stands on a firm principle of freedom and opposing the hate crime bill is, in a way, a sort of party that's worth voting for. Right, we'll come back to Jim. Okay, so um, we're going to try... I, I'm going to try Jenny again, just for the hell of it, because... Um, right, Let well, me see. Right, on you go. I, um, I just wanted to say, and it's perhaps uh, already the, the, the opportunity has slipped past, but I agreed with Ian McQuirter that Nicola Sturgeon doesn't really want into a, a, a referendum, certainly not in the immediate future. Um, but the point is that she is pushing ahead with all the paraphernalia which goes around getting, you know, parliamentary consent for a for a bill and et cetera, and the legal channels and everything else. And the whole point is that the SNP government have used the whole question of a referendum as a constant smokescreen against any accounting, um, you know, for their um, performance in government. Consistently, she has submerged the questions um, of answering, you know, questions about her performance um, by this constant harping on about the referendum and, of course, the fact that it's anti-democratic, that they are being denied another referendum. So a lot of talk about how anti-democratic the Westminster government are, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the, the point is that she will continue with this. And I think, in fact, will it will actually determine the outcome of the election in May. Um, that uh, again, the focus is taken off their record in government. But I wanted to make another point, and that was on the whole question of um, democracy and what the problem with this whole question of independence has become. And that is that I don't, I don't think the Scottish electorate have been immune from identity politics. What's crept back in over the last few years 
is again this idea of Scottish identity, you know, of the fact that Scottish, the Scots are exceptional, are different from the English. And in the whole post war period, that has been the raison d'etre of the SNP's argument, actually, that it has been anti Westminster, anti English, and we've got a big chip on our shoulder. We are the victims of anti English, uh, of uh, anti Scottish. Um, you know, feelings and in particular actions by Westminster governments that have disadvantaged us. And that's a terrible, I think it's a, a terrible problem for people in Scotland because actually it, it in some ways is, is very incapacitating, very passive. So in, instead of actually saying, no, hang on a minute. We have got no say in, the, in, in, in politics in Scotland. The SNP has deliberately and consciously centralized things and centralized things, emasculated any local politics. And we are in fact completely voiceless really under an SNP government. But of course the, the, the facade of independence has I think actually um, cast that you know in concrete. It's it's a terrible liability I think for ordinary people in Scotland, and I think the whole discussion about democracy is essential. And I would really support those people who've said that 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 is the issue we should try and push to the fore um, in talking about. May elections and subsequently talking about independence. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Jenny. We're going to go to Carlton, then Helen after Carlton. And just before we go to Carlton, there'll be people here who maybe have got a question in their heads that they want to ask and they're not sure. Um, got 45 minutes to go still. So we're friends here. Just cut, chip in with your question. If you've got a thought, say it. it doesn't have to be as eloquent as long as some of our previous contributions. Just, just say it, okay? You'll kick yourself if you don't. So Carlton, then Helen. Uh, I just wanted to uh, just agree with uh, something Michelle made a point, and I think she was picking up on something that Stuart's uh, made a point earlier, and it's that um, I think kind of one of the principal questions of kind of political life in Scotland and how to open political life up in Scotland is that I, I think what we need is devolution within Scotland to an extent in the sense of opening up uh, kind of uh, channels of discussion, giving uh, kind of access to communities to make decisions in their own uh, uh, favor, et cetera, et cetera. And I think kind of one of the first things perhaps is to establish a, a properly proportional electoral system uh, in, in Scotland in the way that we vote for our representatives because a system that is deliberately organized around stopping a majority is not a, a democratic system as, as far as I can make out. So I think we need to kind of have uh, perhaps a discussion within the assembly and assembly members and parties, perhaps something uh, political parties could stand on as well as opposing the hate crime bill would be to establish a properly fully proportional uh, electoral system to allow other voices to, to, to intervene. Just brief, finally, I just wanted to briefly comment on the point that Alistair made about responsibility and how independence discussion seems to kind of backtrack and uh, present it itself as an opposite in the sense that it is not about taking responsibility, quite the contrary. It's about seeking other handouts from other blocks through which it can avoid taking responsibility, that kind of elite can avoid taking responsibility for their decisions. And I kind of think that permeates down into Scottish society more broadly because I know a number of friends and a number of colleagues who spit feathers and pull their hair out in terms of the SNP's decisions around the hate crime bill and the, their position on trans and the, the gender uh, realignment act and things like that. But however, will happily trot along uh, to the election polls and vote uh, uh, the SNP because of 
independence because it's this idea that come independence everything's going to be okay and i kind of think what's happened i think that and what that illustrates is just how hollowed out the concept of independence has actually become because it's kind of become a a kind of ideological safe space it's become a kind of middle class version of political furlough where you don't actually have to interact with the realities of the political situation that you live in that you can hide behind the kind of the notion of independence to avoid taking responsibility for the the political and the material circumstances within which uh, we're living and i kind of think that's what independence has become within scotland it's become a way of actually avoiding making those decisions and taking responsibility for acting as independent autonomous uh, individuals and i kind of think that finally just to say i think one of the the glaring ironies over the last particularly over the the, the pandemic we've seen a, a dramatic shift in terms of the the smp hierarchy from independence to identitarianism the the, the rise of identity politics and i think this is the future for, for Scotland, unless something radically happens in terms of we will see the the kind of <laughs> the, the kind of nature of identity politics becoming much more uh, divisive uh, and, and much more of a, an element of kind of the way in which uh, kind of the kind of forms of elites kind of cohere themselves and police society. And finally, I think one of the ironies. Uh, of, of this moment is that actually the biggest barrier to Scottish independence is the devolved assembly itself. So I think there's a lesson to be learned for anybody who's actually interested in being a proper nationalist is that you have to argue for the dissolution of the Scottish assembly. Interesting. Um, okay, Helen and then Kevin. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with a lot of what's been said, particularly Carlton just was discussing there, um, the point about a, a true way of voting to get representation. And of course, the list system is a disaster. And you know, I was in a campaign for Scottish Assembly in the 80s, and I didn't vote for the parliament. And I didn't vote for the parliament mainly because of the list system, which even at that time, I thought was a bad idea because basically what you do is you give parties the opportunity to pick the people who they want to be behind them. Um, and what they do is they pick yes men. And in the first parliament, that wasn't so obvious. You know, there was a lot of enthusiasm. And of course we had some other independents and some you know, other parties. We had the, the pensioners party, for instance. And also, of course, we have the huge problem, which sadly is not really coming out because everything is presented as sturgeon versus salmon. But of course, what we have seen in the committee investigating that are some of the many flaws in the parliament, which is the committee does not address the unicameral nature of the parliament. We have basically the government are running the show. And as has been pointed out, the SNP have got more of not quite a majority, but they might as well have because they have the Greens behind them. And so the committees don't do that job. And in the first parliament, I think the committees did it a bit more. They were a bit less party political um, and people had that enthusiasm. And so really, you know, wouldn't it be nice if instead of discussing endlessly whether we can have all these parties and these new parties and who would you vote for and let's all go back out and vote for the person who was second last time, if we could just vote under a single transferable vote. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we really wanted and they could be individuals and uh, it's pleased to see Jim saying here here we had a few independents and of course Margot Macdonald got to stay on because she was well known and, and was fantastic but it was about our last independent in the parliament um, Michelle, Michelle is now one by getting there by getting voted in as a party and it's not good enough you know and the list system does not work in that way and of course, another simple thing that could be done to address that would be to remove the 500 quid that you have to put down to stand on the list and ask people to go out and get 100 signatures to back them, for instance. Um, and so these are ways that the parties have controlled it. And, and it's sad that we're not addressing what is fundamentally wrong with, with the Scottish Parliament. And David Davis re referred to some of these. Um, and so I suppose another thing I would just say is I would absolutely agree with people saying that um, the SNP use independence to avoid taking responsibility for anything. We have two children's hospitals that are a disgrace that have been built and not opened or have killed children and not a murmur is said. The health 
secretary is still there running the most important thing that has happened in Scotland in the last 18 months. And nobody says a word because all we need to talk about is, is independence. And, and so I don't know how you get accountability in this unpleasantness. And, and I would just agree with Michelle as well about how unpleasant it was in the referendums and how divisive it was. And, uh, you know, I was surprised to see, um, I can't remember, I think it was Alistair said that the referendum, uh, Brexit referendum was inspiring. Well, all I can say was for those of us that stood a few of us on a stand in the in the streets with no politicians at all in Scotland bar one backing it, it was frightening. It was frightening to go and stand on a stand and actually say, yes, there are some people in Scotland. Turned out there were at least a third of people in Scotland who wanted that. So I'm afraid the referenda are very divisive and, and I would fright, be frightened to go in one again, despite the fact of having the intellectual arguments on our side. So, so I hope we don't have to go there, but we have to find a way to prick the SNP total dominance so that it's a one party state and the civil service are out of control. And I absolutely agree with people who said we need to get control back to more local areas. Highland Council is the size of Belgium. What sort of democracy is that locally? Thank you. Thank you, Helen. I'm going to go Kevin, and then after that, I'm going to take my life in my hands and give Jim Sillers another shot to see if his internet's working. So, um, we, so Kevin, then Jim, and, and then uh, Jeff wants to come in too. Um, I'm going to disagree with a few people in a nice fraternal way. See if you look at the question of tonight's debate, which is what now for Scottish independence. Turn that question around for a second and ask yourself, what now for the union? Question mark. And you look at the SNP and the spat between Nicholas Sturgeon and Alex Salmond, and yet independence still today sits at 50%. That's phenomenal. People here are, are massively complacent and underestimating the desire and the demand for Scottish independence. And let me tell you why I think that is. As someone who doesn't like the SNP, I want to identify what I think is the cause. The union, the UK is moribund. It's dying. It's cracking up. It's finished. People need to get a grip of themselves here. Can't you, you can't you smell the coffee? That's what the debate has to be. Now, I voted for Brexit because I wanted to shake things up as well. But can I tell you, the UK is a corpse. It's absolutely dying. And the fact that people aren't even talking about that is phenomenal. Let me go on to Alistair, good comrade and friend. He talks about exceptionalism as if that's a way to dismiss the desire for Scottish independence. Let me tell you, I know the West of Scotland particularly well. The overwhelming majority of Scottish people there absolutely aren't political with a big P. But to see Boris Johnston and London as another planet, these people are alien to them. Now, whether you want to slag it off or not, you can characterise this as social democracy, and that's what defines them. Now, Carlton and Jenny can come in, and they've got half a point when they want to describe the desire for Scottish independence as identity politics, but you're too complacent if you're just going to leave it at that. There are hundreds of thousands and millions of Scottish people who've had enough of the UK. And my question is, what is the UK offering them? I can't see anything that the UK is offering these people to be part of the union. That's what the debate has to be. And I'm going to be really arrogant, forgive me, because I'm usually humble, but I also disagree with Ian. Ian McWhorter is obviously an expert in this question, but I absolutely think there will be a referendum well within the next 10 years. And it won't, because of, it won't be because of the SNP. It will be because of the Scottish people and the State of the Union. So I absolutely want to finish by saying, say, I, I do think that the Union is cracking up and that's where the debate is at. And if you don't mind me putting the wee plug in, Simon, I believe that Quickly. so much <laughs> that on Thursday night, the Liverpool Salon in conjunction with the new organisation, IrishBorderPool.com, are having the debate with people from Scotland, England, and the North of Ireland, unionists, pro-union people, and people who want to leave the union. So if you disagree with me, or you're curious to find out more, sign up to the Liverpool Salon on Thursday night. Magic. Thanks, Kevin. 
Um, right, we're going to give Jim a shot. I, I want to start with um, Carlton and Alec, and to some and Helen, and to some extent Kevin. Um, I think, and in fact, I'm convinced of it, that there are very significant historic, economic, and political forces at work driving what is termed Scottish nationalism. It's, if you look at why, when did the SNP first start to emerge, it was actually a year before Winnie Ewing's by-election, at the Pollock by-election. And I was a Labour uh, election agent. And all the full-time election agents were pulled into Pollock. And George Leslie was the SNP candidate. We'd never heard of him. As a matter of fact, we'd never heard of the SNP. He got something like 28% of the vote. Then when he won the Hamilton by-election in the following year. And one of the reasons was that the United Kingdom began its period of economic failure. So what had been a very rich pasture for the Scots needs to be so. So there was an economic problem and then that became allied to the historical thing from 1707 and Burns's poet about a parcel of roads in the nation, which resonates with Lord Scott. I am deeply concerned about the state of democracy in Scotland. Today there was in the Parliament no confidence vote on the leader of the government. It was allocated 40 minutes. Now, maybe it's because I come from a Westminster tradition, but no one from my tradition could even imagine allocating only 40 minutes with very short speeches to a no confidence vote on what is the Scottish Prime Minister in a sense. And if you look at our democracy, a parliament is the forum in which the nation sends its representatives to discuss, debate, and probe. We've got a three-day parliament. The speaking allowance for people is between four and six minutes. It's a very good job. There are no Nye Bevins and Michael Foots and Ian McLeod in the Scottish Parliament, and they would feel strangled by the standing orders. How in four and six minutes can you develop any theme, discuss any political philosophy, examine any political ideology? That's one of the flaws. The other flaw in a democracy, or a democracy, isn't about one man, one person, one vote. It's about whether every group and class is represented in the forum of the nation, the parliament. I doubt very much there's much working class representation at Hollywood, because we now have a political class, and Humza Yusuf, is the outstanding example of that. Never done a real job in his life as most of the political class have not done. Work experience, no, except being assistance to an MSP or a researcher to an MP or an MSP. What do we get out of that? We get an intellectual elitism. They know better than we do. And then, what do they give us? Single police force. That is the coercive arm of government in one single body, profoundly undemocratic. And it's also been mentioned by other people and contributors that the centralization has been enormous. Why, for example, should the Western Isles people not go in Caledonian what they and the Western Isles people not decide what kind of ferries that they actually want. And the list system, I know from experience with Marvel, it's a closed list system. This list from the SNP <laughs> may, number one on the Lothian list, 
placed there by the leadership is a Glasgow councillor. Now, where in the name of God can we get a Glasgow councillor who knows about Edinburgh, who knows about the deprived areas in Lothian, Mid Lothian and West Lothian? It's a nonsense. So I agree entirely with what Helen said, that this is an extremely pernicious system. And yet we have one, STV, we use for local government. But why don't we use it for the bigger, higher level of representation at the Scottish Parliament? The last two things I want to um, reply to is Sandra and Stuart. Sandra said, is anyone there who supports independence not going to, as it were, refer to the priorities that ordinary people have? Well, Sandra, I'm on record in an article in the Sunday Times some time ago saying that for the SNP, they should put the referendum away down number six on the list because we have an education crisis. We had it before the pandemic, we've now got it in spades. How are we going to make up to our children the damage that's been done to their education by school closures? We've got a pandemic that three times has thrashed the business base in our economy. We don't even know at the moment just how bad it is but we can all guess it's not going to be very good. The priority is to get that back and to get jobs back. These are the priorities that should be there at the moment. And if we had good political leadership in the SNP or any other independence party, they should say to the people, look, we believe in independence. We believe sometime there will be a referendum on this when the time is right. But right now, the priority is to restore Scottish business base, restore Scottish education, and tackle the NHS problems that we're going to have as a result of the NHS being NHS COVID and not NHS for cancer and all the other problems that people have. So there are a number of us in the SNP to know what the priorities are. I think if any party goes into the election in May and says, look, the Constitution, of course, it seems to be important to lots of people, but let's get our priorities right, then there may be a very different result from what the polls are indicating at the present time. Very good, Jim. Thank you. And that, that kind of answers my Slightly cynical question of um, Ian when I was saying surely the SNP is synonymous with independence, but an in independence campaign is seeing other priorities and other important things, whether that takes an organisational form, an, a, a ballot or in a par party political sense, I think is an interesting question. Um, we're we're going to go to Jeff and after that I think we'll go back to the panel um, for some concluding thoughts um, and then we'll probably knock it on the head unless we don't have any other questions. Um, so if you want to ask a question, get it in now, get your hand up. Um, so Jeff, then the panel. So well, following on from Kevin, uh, I think I've probably got a different view on the union from Kevin, but I thought he made some very valid points because Carlton's point is true that despite all the faults with the SNP and all the things people have talked about, many people, hundreds of thousands, will go out and vote for them, as I see it, Obviously, we'll see what happens in the election uh, with a view that independence means something at least, even if it is somewhat hollowed out. Whereas what does the union mean? And it is a challenge to people on the panel and people after this discussion, because it's all very well said, well, there's Brexit and that means the United Kingdom is different and separate. And that's obviously true. The pandemic, you know, Boris Johnson talks about the NHS uniting the nation. But if you look at the, uh, the pandemic, it's Nicola Sturgeon and in Wales it's Drakeford who've taken the lead. And if anything, that has divided the component parts of the United Kingdom more and making their own rules more than has ever happened before. And arguably as much has happened even through uh, devolution. And, and so, the, 
you know, balkanization of the United Kingdom might be taking it too far, but the, but the idea that there's something which unites us from John O'Groats to Land's End to Pembroke to Norwich, it doesn't seem that strong to me. Um, and I, I mean, I voted Brexit. I, I would like it there to be a common purpose for people across the United Kingdom, but in all <coughs> kinds of ways, politically, culturally, and whatever, we seem to be getting more and more distant. So is there a way that anybody can uh, uh, advocate or begin to reform, maybe we need to, to put a positive, uh, you know, a positive view forward? Because otherwise, the fear, and maybe Kevin wants it to happen, but the fear from my point of view, which Kevin outlines, could well become, uh, would well become a reality uh, almost by default. These are great questions. Um, I've got I've got one hand up, and then I'm going to go to the the panel um, in the order that they spoke in. So, well, <laughs> that they didn't speak in. So, so Jim, we'll go to you first, then Michelle, um, then then Ian, then Alistair. But first of all, Alex wants to come in, and then we'll just go to the panel for their last thoughts. Alex, uh, a very quick question to the panel: What do you mean by democracy? Okay, very direct, simple question. So if the panel can try and cover that and, <laughs> and everything else. Um, uh, well, Jim, can we come back to you? Yes. Um, before you can have a genuine democratic society, you have to have an extremely well-educated population. And over the last 30, probably 40 years, the political parties have ceased to engage in informal but very important political education. Brought up in the Labour movement, we used to have it actually, it was run from Tilly Kutry, believe it or not, an informal um, college of education um, where we were, we were actually taught to think wider than just the narrow party or ideological position. We haven't had that for many years and I think before you even start to talk uh, about the mechanisms of how you get elected to parliament, that we really have to have a look at how do you politically educate? And I think it's a duty, for example, on members of parliament who have enormous resources that ordinary people don't have. They have huge resources in the House of Commons Library, for example, one of the best research organizations in the world. My generation, I, I don't want to sound like boasting, but my generation made speeches at the weekend to be reported in the papers and radio and television. Uh, we wrote articles. And that was part of our duty to engage in the political education of the people we're going to ask to vote. That's gone. And so that is solved. You can't ever claim to have a perfect democracy. That, that's the one thing. The two things I'd like to wind up on is that part of the problem that has developed for the SNP over the years has been the cult of personality. In fact, Ian McWhirter's report after one of the conferences, and I cut it out at the time and I've kept it Ian, Ian's report on the conference was, it's salmon, salmon, salmon. Cult of personality was born with Alec. It's been intensified uh, under Nicola. So you've had authoritarianism inside the party, and you shouldn't be surprised if you haven't had authoritarian, authoritarianism inside the parliament. We've had what I think is impossible in any other democratic organization. We've never had a revolt by backbench. SNP members of the Scottish Parliament. I, I would say that's almost impossible. It's impossible that they were all of one mind on everything, but it is run on an authoritarian basis. So we shouldn't be surprised that it produces an authoritarian hate crime bill that says if I am in my home with my family discussing certain matters, actually I could be committing a crime. That is 
extraordinary thing that's happened in our society. Finally, there is the anxiety I have, which has arisen out of what has been revealed through this judicial review, sturgeon, salmon, set to. For the independence movement, I don't think it's enough now to just think we try to achieve independence. We have to think of what kind of country that we are going to have the time after when we are in fact independent. I've actually had people say to me, who voted yes in 2014, that if independence means being controlled by the gang that is in at the present time, it is something they don't want. So the independence movement has a bigger problem than a whole number of people who read the national newspaper realize at the present time. And I think that's likely to unfold in the reality of the ballot box on the 6th of May. Thanks, Jim. I, I, I love having you on salons, Jim. You're brilliant. <laughs> That's very clear. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to go to Michelle. <coughs> okay, well, let, let's start with the question about democracy. I mean, I'm, I'm a great believer that democracy is when you can go out, you can vote, and you can feel that your vote influences then what happens in terms of decision making. And I think that's been slightly the problem with democracy. Because now when people go out vote, the number of people you hear say, oh, it doesn't matter whether I vote or not, it's not going to make any difference, it's not going to change who's in there, and it's certainly not going to change the way they behave. So I think we've lost the connection between your vote and the decisions that get made in your parliament, whether it's Holyrood or whether it's down at Westminster. And even at local authority level, you don't always feel that you're connected. So, so we've got to look at how we can reconnect the feeling that your vote matters and your vote makes a difference. And that is why people did get excited about the referendums, because your individual vote felt like it counted for more, that every vote would be counted up and the total would decide it. Um, so I think that's one of the things that, that we have a problem with. In terms of uh, the comment about a three day parliament, can I just dispute that slightly? Um, three days in the parliament building but it's not that you're not working the other four, because I believe you, me, and if any of you, well, those of you who've been in an MSP or an MP know that, but any of you who get to be one in the future, um, you'll find you work a hell of a lot more than three days. Um, it, I've certainly found it's more like a six and a half day week if you give yourself half a day off. Um, so it's not a three day week, but I would absolutely agree with Jim's comments about the way the parliament works. It is not a parliament of good debate or the proposition of ideas. It is a shutdown parliament. You're allocated a short amount of time. You can't develop anything. Uh, that's if you can get to speak in the first place. Questions are actually filtered. You know, they're looked at. You get your question back and, and told you can't ask that or could you rewrite it? You know, the freedom of what you can do and say is sorely limited. Um, the bums on the seat effect is, is pretty bad, to be perfectly honest with you. The numbers are quite small, so you haven't got Westminster's volume to create big dissension groups. But yeah, there's a lot of bums on seats in there that, that fundamentally, you know, they're not going to not going to break the whip, they're not going to argue, they're not going to stand up for what they believe in, because they might not get in next time because they won't, the party just won't give them space on the list or a constituency to run in. So, and combine that with the fact that there's an awful lot of inexperienced people. So they have ideas or they've heard an idea from somebody, but they've no flipping idea how to deliver it on the ground. They've got no operational experience of services or of private industry whatsoever. And you can tell that from some of the commentary that comes out in the debates when they're talking about employers or they're talking about the workplace or they're talking about, you know, how the health service operates. They really don't know because they've never been there. And that, that does not help when you're making law. Um, and, you know, politicians are there to make law. That's one of their jobs. And we make a lot of poor law. I mean, I have sat there absolutely gobsmacked by some of the things that have been put through the parliament. It, it's just not good. And frankly, most of them are broken on a daily basis. We're overwhelmed with statute. And yet, the system doesn't doesn't work. So, so there's some real problems about the quality of what we're doing in the parliament. 
So I, I would say to you, Scotland's been poorly served um, by politicians that are, are pursuing ideology on both sides of the fence, um, that vote what they're told to vote in, quite often without even knowing what they vote for. And we need people in there who stand up for what they believe in, that you voted in because you listen to what they had to say, and then they do what they said they were going to do when they get there. That's democracy. That's when you actually feel that you have a say in what's going on. Um, so we've, we've got a problem, and this was all about the future of independence. And I think we've had some really interesting points on this tonight. And I would totally agree with what Jim said. And the polls are showing it as independence is not everybody's priority. And I tell you what, it falls down their priority when their child doesn't pass their exams or when they can't get their hip replacement or where they can't get an appointment with a GP or they find themselves in, in, in court for singing a, a song that they had been singing all their life with their papa and their grandpa before them. Or when you have a conversation around your dinner table and you find the police at your door because you've been told you're inciting hatred because your child's gone to school and said something. We have got to sort this out because independence's argument is irrelevant if our company is if our country is economically struggling, if our children are struggling. And I totally agree, you've got to educate people, but it's not just about educating them about politics. They've got to read, they've got to write. They've got to be able to add up and subtract and multiply. And for God's sake, if they can't work out 10% of something without a calculator, we've got to ask ourselves what's gone wrong. But my final point, and, and I, we haven't mentioned this at all, but part of the reason politics is struggling is we've reduced it to sound bites, to the number oh. of characters that fit on a text, the number of characters that fit on a, on a tweet. You know, that's what politics has become. It's all about that social media bite, that headline in the papers. You know, it's become lazy journalism in many cases. Let's get back a few good investigative journalists and let's get back voters who actually have met their politician, who've listened to them speak, who know what they individually stand for. And then we might have a parliament, A, that's worth voting for, and B, that delivers the kind of country we want to live in and grow in and work in. That's what it's about. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was um, very good, very useful. Um, so we're on to, uh, the, you, you've been demanding a, a journalist, and now we've got a journalist. Here we are. Ian. Yes. Well, um, um, are you hearing me okay? Am I on yep. mute? Yes. Okay. So, well, I mean, democracy is government of the people, by the people, for the people. And the problem that has faced Scotland, the Scottish question over the last half century is that Scots felt they were successively voting for governments in Westminster, which they didn't favour. Conservative governments, when they were voting overwhelmingly in those days, it was for the Labour Party. And that was resolved to a certain extent by, um, uh, by the Scottish Parliament, and that is still working itself out. I see this as a very long process. It doesn't necessarily happen in one referendum. It doesn't happen in one decade. And you know, I think you can see a historical movement there, which is undeniable. It doesn't mean there's going to be a, another referendum anytime soon. I mean, I think it might surprise people that the supporters of independence here in this panel are, are seem to be a lot less bullish about the prospects for independence than, uh, than some of the people who are um, just attending it and listening in. And, and um, that is, is surprising because the uh, uh, you know, the SNP does dominate politics in Scotland. It's successive. It's, it's, uh, I mean, it has more and more um, MSPs and all the other parties combined, even though it doesn't have an overall majority um, uh, because the, of the, the nature of the Scottish parliamentary uh, electoral system, which, I mean, you know, you, every system has its um, drawbacks single transferable vote. I don't think there's any, I don't think it's particularly better than the additional member system. This is wholly selected by the Hunt method, actually, which is supposed to be ultra democratic. Um, but, um, you know, as I say, uh, almost, almost every uh, electoral system has its, has its drawbacks. They, the, good, the great thing about referendums though, and, you know, there is no doubt that whatever you felt about the 2014 referendum, it was a massive uh, democratic engagement by people who had been alienated from the political process. There was 97% voter registration on the eve of um, 
that referendum. That's unprecedented. In fact, most people didn't think you could get 97% voter registration because of movement of people and people dying and what have you. And turnout was, it was a historic, was 85%, which is higher than any, any uh, major election in the United Kingdom um, before, in, in recent times. And, and you know, that was, a, that was a very important democratic moment. And that, and I sense that was the most important uh, um, expression of uh, of intent, I think, by the Scottish people, and that the consequences of that are still resonating today. But this this process is detached from um, the immediate future of the Scottish National Party. And again, I think you'll find perhaps surprisingly that many people in Scotland who who see themselves as having supported independence in the past are distinctly unimpressed by uh, the character of the the Scottish National Party government as it is at the moment. And I would like to very forcefully add my voice to those who said they are appalled that Scotland is now the only country, so far as I know, in the Western world where you can now be prosecuted for hate crime in the privacy of your own home. Because under the this iniquitous hate crime bill, which has been pushed through Parliament and shockingly has largely been supported by the Labour Party, um, there is no dwelling defence any longer. Uh, uh, you know, Inspector Yousaf can come and tap you on the shoulder or one of your family members can grasp you for saying something unpleasant about, I don't know, trans women not being women or what have you, and you can actually be given potentially seven years in, in jail for that offence. I think that's absolutely outrageous. The whole concept of the stirring up hatred, um, which is this new concept of hate crime which is being introduced, is itself very, very poorly worked out. Um, and is not going to be workable, uh, hopefully, hopefully in practice. With, with any luck, it'll go the same way as the offensive behaviour at football, Bill, and the uh, named persons measures, which uh, fell foul of civil liberties uh, legislation, ultimately. So that's, that's all I'm, I, I don't really have, have much, a great deal more to say uh, about this. I'm dis despair of what, what we've, has been revealed in the course of the, uh, the Salmon inquiry about the way in which the prosecution service, apart from anything else, operates in Scotland. Um, as you may know, unlike in England, the, the uh, Lord Advocate, the head of the prosecution service, is actually a, a, a member of, of the, the government, uh, sits in Nicola Sturgeon's cabinet. And that, that there's an obvious conflict of interest there, which I think was revealed by the extent to which that, um, that uh, inquiry was frustrated at every turn by unjustified censorship. Uh, from the Crown Office and from the Scottish Government. It was ultimately the Scottish Government who was responsible for that. That's, I think, uh, that's very unfortunate uh, for the SNP because I think it's lost a tremendous amount of support in, uh, in, in the last few months. I, I'm mystified about why it has taken this authoritarian turn because, it, you know, it's, it's not really in character. The, the Scottish National Party in the past was always, for obvious reasons, very supportive of freedom of speech. Not least because people used to try to suppress um, uh, supporters of independence in Scotland and claimed that they were either traitors on the one hand or else they were um, far right wing nationalists on the other. So I think, you know, this is politics uh, is, is not in a good way in Scotland. I think we've, we've discovered that in the past week, but it's not going to lead to a referendum anytime soon. Actually, I think this would have been an opportunity if there's been an imaginative government in Westminster, an imaginative prime minister, what they'd have done is this. They have said, right, we're out of Europe, we're going to have a new constitutional settlement here. What we'll do, we'll go back to 2014, and what we'll say is we'll give Scotland full economic and tax raising powers, but within a new United Kingdom. So you remake the United Kingdom in a different form. Remake, in other words, as, the, as, they, they, as uh, they said in, um, in, in the Leopard, uh, for everything must change in order for things to remain the same. Thank you. Good talk. Um, Alistair. Okay, I agreed with lots of that actually. Um, I, I mean, to go back to Kevin's point on 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 the, the there's nothing, uh, no dynamic within the union. I mean, obviously, in in one sense, that's true. Although the last four or five years of coming out of the European Union have to me suggested that there is something, some sort of sense of dynamic, at least about the process of leaving that means that once you're outside, then at least you're in a position to decide things yourself. And in the same way as uh, there was something positive to that uh, move to extract herself from a, you know, an, an institution like the EU, which I think weighed life down within the UK, um, 
at the same time, I, I, I don't think there's anything to celebrate at all about what is basically a process of balkanization within the UK of it falling apart. I mean, that, that to me doesn't seem to have a positive dynamic. And I agree with the points that Carlton made about independence basically not being something that's active, active in, 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 in any sense. It's, a, it's almost like just a, a, an avoidance of responsibility and acceptance uh, that we cannot do anything about a current predicament or Scotland can do anything about its current predicament within the boundaries of the UK. That doesn't seem to me, that sort of fatalistic view of the world doesn't seem to me to be uh, something to, to celebrate, albeit I kind of know that Kevin's coming from a point of view of wanting a separate Ireland. And that, to me, is a slightly different question from uh, the, the, the question of Scottish independence. I mean, I basically thought Jim made a lot of good points on the character and nature of the Scottish Parliament as a failing institution. It just seems to me that it's failing not because... Um, the last was, minute of this. Oh, God, my thing down there. oh, my God. Oh, it's their interference. Sorry, sorry, people have got their microphones on. <laughs> Um, the, the, the failure of the Scottish Parliament seems to me to be not, it's not something that ever particularly offered a bright, shiny future for Scotland and has been corrupted, but it was the nature of, it, 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 it's rooted in the nature of what the Scottish Parliament is at the, at the very time it was set up, which was a time of, you know, we need to remember in the, the 1970s, 1980s, the UK politics was failing. People, it was becoming exhausted. People were no longer um, committed to the existing parties of the time. They saw Westminster, rightly as people have said, as a kind of distant rule, a sleazy institution that a lob full of lobbyists and, and kind of not a very productive environment. But the Scottish solution, the Scottish alternative to that wasn't a particular particularly productive one either, I don't think, because it was based on all the types of things that people have said, a, a, a desire for PR, um, which was, you know, even at the time was a desire to take the heat out of politics, as it were. That, that, that was the whole point. The committee rooms and that system were a desire to push debate into the realm of experts and and people who uh, could take decisions beyond and away from the, the Scottish people. I mean, that was the whole purpose of the Scottish Parliament at the time. So I, I think the predicament of the Scottish Parliament today reflects how it was created, and therefore its removal as, as the thing that governs Scotland is, is an important, start, important starting point. And to the question, does it... Is there is Scotland a culture that's pulling apart from the rest of the UK? Well, you know, it just seems to me that there's a series of common issues. I mean, I'm not saying that they're dealt with in the same way, but there is a series of issues in Scotland and England that are fairly common to both countries. I mean, the the predicament of education and universities to me seems to be you know reasonably similar situation. The the way that discussion of the economy is dominated by this idea that environmental solutions will solve the problems of the economy, which ultimately, I, I think, will undermine the productivity of both the UK and Scottish economies. Um, the, the way that identity politics has got a grip within the institutions of both countries. I mean, these seem to me to be a common set of issues that, you know, okay, they're being discussed in separate realms just now, in separate, separate parliaments, but they're producing, uh, it would seem, the same questions to people on the north and south of the border. I'm not saying that the, the, the solution is necessarily to uh, within the UK as, as, as a whole, but it does seem to me that the whole independence idea is a retreat from taking responsibility of solving some of those problems. And so Alex's question of what is democracy, I mean, it to me, it's it's people having the possibility of developing a critical response to what's going on in society and gaining a voice for it within their political institutions. Whether that's Scotland or the UK remains to be seen, but it does seem to me that giving that voice is the kind of important starting point to something a bit more productive in the future. Thanks very much, Alistair. That was a clear summary at the end there. Thank you. And, and can everybody, I don't know how we do this. I kind of want to kind of do claps and things like that, but to Michelle, <laughs> Ian, Jim and Alistair, thanks very much for giving up your time and 
um, uh, kind of provoking this discussion. Thank you. No, that was really good. Um, we've normally go to the pub now, but we